Hello guys and welcome to this talk called Little Jenkins Guide to Web3 Gaming Security Custom Watson Edition. It's a very sexy and long name, isn't it? And I want to introduce you my baby, a very original, original game I have created. Let me show you. Any similarity with another game, it's just coincidence, by the way. And you can see uh, that this is like, a, okay, it's a, a game, has a wallet, I approve the transaction. I'm gonna play a little, just for showing you my skills playing video games. So I am this little fish, and I'm gonna try to pass the pipe. One, two, oh, <laughs> fuck. <laughs> okay, maybe I'm not too good playing video games. Sometimes, actually, I suck playing video games. What I'm, suppo what I'm supposed to do to win the game? Well, you can say, Luis, you can make an effort every day and practice until, until you master your skill. Does it make sense? No, because we are hackers and hackers hack games. That's what we are going to do today. So let me introduce myself a little. My name is Luis Quispe Gonzalez. I work at Halbor, a company specialized in security for emerging technologies. We are talking about blockchain, smart contracts, Web3 gaming, etc. So if you want to remember something about this slide, it's two things. The first one, I love retro gaming. So I like to deal with 16-bit games, Super NES, for example, Sega, etc. And also, I like gaming security. So that's why I enjoy hacking video games. If you want uh, to contact me, here are my social network, LinkedIn, and, and Twitter. Okay, so let's start. Oh. What is the agenda for today? We are going to do like a, we're going to have like a quick intro to Web3 Gaming. Very quick, I'm gonna, I promise you. Uh, then we are going to see the security process in a Web3 game. And after that, we are going to see the attacks. Client-side attack, server attack, and of course, a, a smart contracts attack. So let's start. What is Web3? So there are many definitions. I'm gonna put here a very simple one. Web3 gaming, as the name indicates, involves gaming and involves blockchain. So what are the features of this kind of game? Well, we're talking about ownership. So in a classic game, for example, uh, in a warfare game, uh, you have your sword, your shield, your arrow, your helmet, etc. Those items belong to the player. But in Web3 Gaming, those items can be NFT. And they really belong to you. And it's very interesting because those items, at some point in a classic game, you can trade with other players, you can sell to other players. It's an economy inside a game, here too, but with NFTs. Also, we can, uh, we can transfer assets. And we are not just talking about NFT, it's a myth. A Web3 game, it's not just about NFT. Can involve any other token, an ERC20 token, for example. So you can trade those tokens with other uh, players. You can sell that token in a market. So uh, and even you can transfer that token to other blockchains. So it uh, comes to my mind, a bridge it comes to my mind, IBC. Uh, obviously, it uses blockchain. That's why uh, all the logic is in the smart contracts. Uh, and obviously, there are some new schemas like play to earn and play and earn. So you play and you earn money. Sounds good, right? Now, let's continue. Uh, we have some examples of Web3 game. We have Axie Infinity, CryptoKitties, Unchain, uh, Gods Unchained, etc. So, but the thing is, how does a Web3 game look like? This is just an image, an example. It could vary, of course. Uh, we have a player that interacts with the game itself. Could be a PC game. And then also his wallet or her wallet interacts with a smart contract. The smart contract could emit some events. These events are uh, read by a bot. The bot put these events in a queue, then they verify the events, and everything is okay, it calls an API, the API communicates with another contract and saves the information. All this interaction is an example of a Web3 game. Again, it could vary among different games. Okay, that's it for Web3 Gaming. Now let's go to the, part, the funny part. Gaming security. So, uh, gaming security. 
Have you heard about news uh, of Web3 games affected in the last years? No? There are many. For, for one side, uh, 600 million, on the other one, 100 million, there is a tip of one, one million, etc. So many attacks that affect the Web3 gaming. So it's important to consider security in the development of Web3 games. So I'm going to show you a very quick uh, process end-to-end -end about security on a Web3 game. Uh, so we have, we have here a client. And when we see the client, we can imagine a PC game, a web browser game, a console game even. And that uh, was in the past. Now we have a client connected with a server. That's uh, most of the, how most of the game work right now. But with um, Web3 games, we also have another component, that is the blockchain. So for each one of them, we can have different attack techniques. And it's important to consider all of them. And actually, it's even possible to have like a special testing for those components. So imagine appears a new console, uh, don't know, Ebox or something like that. H how you can hack uh, that console? Well, you have to do some custom testing to know how, how the architecture works, what are the potential vulnerabilities, etc. So with all of that stuff, we can apply this technique to different targets. As I mentioned, could be different kind of games, but at the end, uh, the tools can vary, but the methodology is the same. So I'm going to show you an example of the game I, I brought today, that it's uh, the vulnerable Flappy Bird. So we have different components. We have a front-end server. We have a client. In this case, it's going to be a web browser. We have a back-end server and a blockchain. So the client retrieved the all the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript files from the front-end server. Now, look like this. And this browser has a wallet. This wallet uh, pay tokens to play the game. And here it's very interesting. For this game, I'm going to pay five Flappy tokens, <laughs> very original, Flappy tokens to play the game. So every pipe I pass, I'm going to earn one Flappy token. So uh, in the real world, I suppose to, to pass more than five pipes to, to make it profitable, right? <laughs> so uh, after that, the, the browser communicates to the back server to get contract addresses, for example, to submit new score for user, etc. The backend communicates with its database. So you can query about the best player, about the highest score, etc. And finally, the backend server communicates to the blockchain. You can manage contract. I mean, you can deploy more contracts if necessary. You can mint flap tokens, of course, and set the best player. So, so far, so good. It's very uh, understandable. Now, we have, let, let's do a quick summary. We have seen that a game has a client, a server, and a blockchain. Now, the idea is to attack each one of them. We are going to start with the client side. OK. In the client side, we use different techniques depending on the target. So it's not the same attacking a PC game that attacking a web browser game, etc. But at the end, they share some ways to attack that are common between all of them. Uh, for example, we can do some techniques like reverse engineering. We can do something like custom code hooking. I mean, we hook in the code and try to modify the behavior of the game, and so on. So for today, I'm going to show you three different kind of game. The Flappy Bird that I showed you uh, before, and two more games. So let's start. Demo time. OK, uh, so I'm going to stop here. And I'm going to show you again my Flappy Bird game. So if you see, now I, I have 44 Flappy coins. And to participate, I need to pay five coins. Right? So I'm going to try to participate. I'm going to prove. OK. I'm going to lose on purpose, just for you to, to see what happens. It's on purpose, eh? Uh, and here, you can see that after I die again, uh, now I have 39 coins, right? That makes sense. OK, so what happens if I don't want to pay those five flappy coins? Can I do something about it? Let's see. If you see, 
the wallet uh, tries to sign this transaction when you pay this amount. That is five floppy coins. So I'm going to go to the browser. And if you see here, the only uh, JavaScript that it loads is bundled JavaScript. We go to bundled JavaScript. We are going to see this value. Aha. Uh -huh. Here we see the code that appears this, this value. So I'm going to change this for one. I'm going to save it. And what happened now? I'm going to try to, uh, well, let's close this. I'm going to try to play, oh, uh, I'm going to, let's change it again, just in case it hasn't, it hasn't saved it. Okay, need to change again to want. Now we save it, okay. Let's wait. Okay, I'm gonna, it take some seconds to, to appear again. A little patient, please. Here, you can see that now the wallet tries to sign a transaction with only one floppy token, not five, only one. So now I have 39. I approve it. I approve it. And now I'm going to play again. I'm going to lose again, just for testing purposes, and to see what happened. Now we have, let's see. Oh, I put 10 floppy tokens instead of one. But you understand the idea. <laughs> OK, now let's change to another game. Because this, oh, well, before, before changing to the game, let's do more tricky with this game. So. As you can see, the flappy birds goes down and up. So we are going to try to avoid the collision with the pipes. So if we look at in the code, for example, mm, collide, add collide. OK, you can start thinking about, Luis, how do you know it's add collider, the word you are looking for? Well, you have the code in front of your uh, face, you can read a code. But the important thing is the more you read the code, you can understand the logic. And let's, I mean, if you are a developer, you try to use words that, are, that make sense to you. So here we have a collider. A collider is a property that allows the two objects collide or not. So here we have a collider between the, the bird and the ground. And on here we have a collider between the bird and the pipes. This is the collider. I'm going to erase it. Yeah. I'm going to save. Go, let's see what happened. OK, we are going to play it again. Approve it. Have to change these values. It's too high. Not sure if I have. Approve it. Let's approve it now. Come on. Okay. Now let's load it again, just in case. I don't want to pay too much for this, to be honest. So again, we are going to to this JavaScript. We are going to add collider, and, and we are going to erase this again. So I erase, oh, I erase it, I save, and now I want to play. It takes some time until the wallet appears. Mm, it's taking too much time. OK, until it appears, OK, here it is. I'm going to prove it. Oh, it's okay. While it's well, it tries to work. We are going to send you. I'm going to show you another game. This game it's for tanks, but I I don't forget the the flappy bird. I'm going to go go back to to the game. So here we have a tank. The idea of this tank obviously is to shoot each other. So I'm gonna put my tank here. Uh, imagine I'm the red tank. 
I'm, and I'm going to shoot uh, with a blue, the, the red one. Oh, I fail. I fail again. No, it, maybe it's the distance. Yeah, it's the distance, definitely. I'm going to move this. OK. Now it's supposed to work. No? No. OK, it works. OK, and sh OK. The blue player won't. Now, let's do it again. We are going to try to, to go each, uh, each other very near. Uh, like this, OK. OK, so you can see here that the life of the red tank is like 100. So we are going to do what it's called memory scanning. So we are going to load this. The second, oh, half internet. I'm going to load it again. It's uh, using WebGL, WebGL, so as you can imagine, it, it's a WASM file, and some, sometimes the WASM file, it's a, a little difficult to, to read. OK, let's do it again. Let's go um, this tank to be very near each other. OK. I'm going to move my tank here. OK, if we see uh, this, I'm going to look for a value, a specific value. In this case, it's going to be 100, because it's the light of the tank. So if I see to 100 uh, in a format a float, let's look for that. And here we have more than 100 results. Which, which one of them it's belongs to the life of the tank? We don't know. But what we can do here is I'm going to shoot the red tank again. OK. Shoot again. I'm going to move it. Mm. Mm. OK, okay. I'm going to shoot again. Now the life has been reduced. So we are, going, we are going to scan again. And now I'm going to look for, in this, in this results, in this previous results, I'm going to look for a value that is less than 100, because now I have less life. I'm going to search again. And I have only two results that you see is 38. OK, so I'm going to add this to bookmark. And uh, this is the value of the lie. I'm going to freeze the value. Freeze the value. And what happens if I shoot again to the tank? <sighs> My life continue being here. I'm not going to die. So now the red, the red tank is invincible. And that's it for this game. Uh, <laughs> Flappy Bird continue. OK, let's see if it works. OK. I don't know if I, uh, at the end, I remove the colliders. Let's see. No, the colliders are there. OK, so let's look for colliders. Just to complete the, uh, uh, here are the colliders. We are going to erase these colliders. I'm going to save it. I want to try to play it again. Let's hope now it works. And meanwhile, it's, it's loading we are going to show a final game for the client side. And this game is called, oh, here. Apparently, it's going to work. Let's approve it. OK, let's wait until the fish appears. OK, now that I have removed the colliders, uh, it's supposed to, hey, I can pass the pipes without dying. And I, of of course, I'm increasing uh, my, my coins. Obviously, I haven't erased the colliders with the ground, so it continues uh, dying with collides with the ground. But now, uh, let's combine different techniques. So we are going to look for this value to decrease it, not make it very, very hard. Uh, and now, you see that the fish continues going up and down. So there is a velocity in the y axis. So let's look for that. Set velocity y. And here you have some values. I'm going to change this to 0. 0 here and 0 here. And also we have gravity. 
So let's look for gravity. And okay, let's look for this word, a low gravity. A low gravity, no, 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 no. We have some examples, okay. Okay. When we start again, the gravity of the bird is true. We are gonna change it to false. Now it's ready. Let's see. Let's see what happened. We are going to pay only one flappy coin. <laughs> Let, let's play a little. Start. Okay, so I can just stand up, uh, <laughs> drink some water while I see that my flappy bird is earning points for me. And, and that's the cool part of this kind of attacks. Okay, now let's load again. And here comes the final boss for the games. Here we have a game called Battle of Westnot. I don't know if you heard about this game. It's a, ga a strategy game. So let's start a um, new campaign, local game, okay. Great game, blah, 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 and ready. So, you see here that I have 75 gold. With this gold, I can buy some monster to create a strategy. So, uh, let's hack this. Um, we are going to have this, uh, this application called Sheet Engine. So, I'm gonna attach this process, in this case, this game. And I'm gonna do a memory scanning again. So, we have 75 gold. I, I'm going to see in the memory, in what part of the memory is stored a value of 75. And I scan, and there are many addresses that have 75. So uh, just to know uh, where is it, I'm gonna recruit uh, a unit, for example, this one. It, it costs um, 14. So after you buy it, you have 61. So let's go again. And now we are going to look for 61. Next scan. And we have one address. Why this happen? Because at the end in a game and in other applications, the value of your life or your goal or whatever, it's stored in a in certain value. This value is in a certain memory address. The value of the goal is going to change, but the value of the memory address, not. So that's why we found this address and we are going to just double click that and show that here is 61. 61 here and 61 here. So I'm gonna change to, let's say, 200, okay? And now you can see here that I have 200. Is it is uh, as easy as that? Well, let's try to, to recruit again. I'm gonna recruit, aha, now one, uh, 186, okay? So we can change the value many times. And in this part, it's supposed to finish the client-side attacks. But you know, uh, I'm a very lazy hacker, and sometimes I don't want to change even the value of the goal. Wouldn't it be very beautiful if I can recruit many times and the value doesn't change anymore? Let's do it. But uh, I'm gonna try this. It's, uh, I, haven't, I haven't tried this demo before, so uh, let's see if it works or not. There is 95% uh, of likelihood that it doesn't work, but let, let's try it anyway. But before that, we are going to have a treat, okay? If it works, I hope it works, but if it works, you, are, you have to say, oh, and you were surprised, okay? <laughs> is, that, is that a deal? Now, oof, oof, okay. We are going to see that this is the memory address. We are going to copy this address here. Okay, now I'm gonna close this little tool. No, and we are going to open a new one. A very sexy tool called X32DBG. Okay, we are gonna, we are gonna attach to a process again, the, the game. I'm gonna attach. I'm gonna go here to look for the 
executable is here, okay? And I'm gonna do some configuration to, be, to make it more clear. Okay, here you can see this very clear code is the assembly code of the game. This is what is running right now. Here you have the register and here is the DAM. So what I'm gonna do, it's going to look for this memory that we know is the memory that contains the number of calls, right? So I'm gonna look for that here. Uh, go to this memory. Okay, it's here. And you can see the values BA. BA in hexadecimal, it's 186, okay? Now, now uh, we are going to, okay, let's, this, let's do this exercise. We are going to introduce a breakpoint in that memory. So when I try to recruit some monster, the logic of, of the program is going to hit this memory address. And as a result, I'm going to see what in the code it's the, the subtraction of the line. So I'm going to include here uh, a breakpoint. I'm going to put uh, here. Okay. I have introduced a breakpoint. So I'm going to continue. I'm going to click many times because uh, it tried to um, it tries to, to execute different commands. I'm going to do many, many times. As you can see, Hacker Life is not easy. We have to do many clicks in the tool. Okay, click, 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 click. Okay, we're going to continue until it is running appropriately. Okay, now it's running. Okay, I'm going to try to recruit some monster. For example, Naga Fighter. I'm gonna recruit it, and it doesn't work because now it's posted here, okay? So here is the pointer, and the last command that was run this was this one. You can see there is a subtraction, right? I don't know if you see, but it's a subtraction between two values. Makes sense because it's a subtraction of the total goal less the cost of the monster. So I'm gonna replace this uh, for knobs knobs command, nob, 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 nob. Uh, now, we, I, we have changed the, the code of the game. So now we are going to remove that, this break, break point and see if it works. We, we have 172. Now we are going to try to recruit an Orchis and we have 172, another Naga fighter and we have 172, and in that way, I never need to co uh, modify the goal again. And now it's your turn. You have to say. Wow. <laughs> okay, guys. Um, we're going to close everything, and let's continue with the presentation. So now it's turn for the server side attacks. Okay, server side, uh, as the name indicates, we are going to try to attack the server of the game. So here we can create, for example, denial of, of services, we can attack a closed service, etc. So for this, uh, in this case, the backend has an APIs. So I'm gonna show you what it's, uh, this is the most common attacks for APIs. It's OWASP API Security Top 10 uh, 2019. You may be wondering why not a more a modern one. The, the thing is that it updates like almost four years, like, like the World Cup. And this year they are working in a new version, but it's just in a beta. It's not the final one. So we are going to focus on three of them. The first one is lack of resources and right limiting. The basic idea here is that you can consume an API and you can make it, very, make it uh, to work very slow, or even you can crash the server. So you have, you have to be careful with the information that you receive and how you process that information. So let's see a very, a very fast example uh, about that. So uh, we have here our, um, okay. Here we have the blockchain, here we have the server, and here we have the client. So I'm gonna connect here. And look at this, uh, close that. 
Okay, so now it does, the server is running. So I'm gonna send, uh, what happened if I send, for example, in the scores, I, we have two parameters, user and scores. What happened if, for example, I send, instead of a real score, a uh, minus one? Appears a success message, but if you see the server, the server was crashed. Why? Because the server didn't expect that value. So we are going to make it work again. And if we see the database, we have an undefined value. Uh, so we are going to remove it. Um, okay, we have removed it. Let's see the game again. Okay, it continues working. So I can do any kind of, of uh, different attacks. Uh, instead of this score, I can say, okay, instead of sending a real address, I'm gonna send a fake address. What happens? Again, it crashes the server. So it's a, a, weak, a weak server. But anyway, uh, so the idea here is that you have to review what is the data that is received by the server to avoid crashes, denied of service, or to avoid uh, to make the, the service slow. We, we are gonna erase again this value from the database. Okay, so we have another attacks, for example, this one, uh, well, ju just uh, to, to mention some remediation, you can use a Docker, of course, you can limit the, uh, how often you can uh, interact with the API. And the most important one, I think, is this one. Add proper server-side validation. You have to validate every information that you receive. You cannot trust the data that the user use. The other one is broken function level authorization. If I have to do a summary, it's if there is an API that is supposed to be um, handled only by the administrator, but a normal user can use it, that's the broken function level authorization. So we are going to see uh, an example. Here, for example, we have this API scores. I'm gonna send an, a post, request, a post um, request to this address and with this value, 69. Because right now, the highest score is 20, right? 20, okay, I'm gonna send it. It works. And if you update again, here you see that the score of the best, um, the best player has increased to 69. And if you see the database, you also see that now it's 69. So this call to this particular uh, API score is supposed to be protected. Not everyone can send a request to that, uh, to that resource. Okay, and finally, we are going to talk, talk for server side about uh, injection. So in injection, okay, here it's something very curious. How many of you have heard about SQL injection? No, it's uh, uh, something very common. So is it possible to do SQL injection or OS injection in the API? Of course. So let's see this example. So imagine that at some, at some part uh, the, the code was fixed. So the previous attack is not possible to do it. But what happened if I do this attack? Uh, look, at, look at here. In user, I put the entire uh, address and then I put or one equal to one order by blah, 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 blah. Uh, what is supposed to do this, this command? Okay, so for sure you already know about this, but just for the recording. Uh, a database, when you query a database, the result that you receive it's because for your query, the database engine is going to review every row, trying to figure out if your condition matches that row. If that condition matches, you receive the row. If many rows matches your condition, so you're going to receive many rows, okay? So what happened here? Most of the time I put user, so in your head you can imagine there is a query asking about this user, and this user is suppo supposed to be unique. But what happens? If you include an or one equal to one, it means that condition is something that could be true or false or true. And you use a true in a conditional like or, everything is going to be true. So you're going to receive all the rows, okay? But then you order by score. 
in such a way that you can uh, receive the first row you receive is the the, fair, the road with the highest score. And then, because you're going to receive many of them, you limit the result to one, only the, the first row. So what happens if I send this? So <coughs> just uh, for you to see, uh, this player, that is another player, not mine, it's 69. And me, it's three. So I'm not the best player, of course. Uh, so I'm gonna send it in such a way that I'm gonna make that the player with the highest score now is going to have one, only one. So let's do it. Okay, if you see the server, it crashes. But if the administrator tries to make it work again, so imagine what happened. Let's load it. Who is the best player? Me. Me, I am the best player. Now with three points, I have erased the value in the database. Now you can see that I have three, my three, and I changed the value of the, the other player to one. That's for server side. Okay. Um, okay, we have seen this. Okay, obviously the remediation, again, is to validate the, the input you receive. So you try to avoid character, ex strange characters like uh, or or the co um, the quotes of the uh, in a user input because in a user is not supposed to use a quote in the in the input so you have to avoid this kind of of data okay finally attacks to cousin wasson smart contracts well what is cousin wasson actually it's a, a smart contracted platform what does it mean let's see with an example for example, uh, you see here, we have the Cosmos SDK, we have a consensus and networking that is Tender Min Core and the ABCI. So basically, Cosmos SDK has many plugins. How do we control the smart contract, the logic in this blockchain created uh, in Cosmos? Well, we can do it in different ways, but one of them is using Cosmos and Watson. We activate this plugin in Cosmos SDK and we have like a unique way, I mean, to create a smart contract over over Cosmos SDK. Um, so now we are going to look uh, at the Cosmos Watson top 10. This is uh, information that was collected uh, having more than 60 Cosmos Watson uh, security audits around more than five or well, six blockchain and uh, reviewing more than 10 different protocols including bridges, NFT and so on. So this is the, the Cosmos Watson top 10 and we are going to focus on some of them. These three, lack of authorization, unexpected default values, and incorrect recipient specification. So the first one, unexpected default values. So you know that uh, there is a default trait in RAS. By the way, uh, the smart contracts in Custom Watson are written in RAS. So this default uh, trait in RAS can have different values, but for primitive, they have the values like zero or false and so on. So what can go wrong here? So imagine this scenario. We have a factory contract uh, where we can create NFTs with certain settings, but only can be done by the administrator. So the administrator is called yes, sends this message, create NFT with this particular setting. So the factory contract verify, is it admin? Yeah. Now we are going to create a signature and save this signature inside the storage of the contract. And after that, we are going to call the register NFT. And we are going to send the signature as a parameter. So we are going to verify the signature that is stored in storage against this parameter. If it's true that is this function ensure correct signature, uh, instantiate a new NFT contract. Okay? Now, what happens if a node admin, for example, Elena, tries to create an NFT with another setting. Well, actually, the first question is, is admin? No, so error, error message. Okay, Elena cries. So what happens here? If we look at the code, uh, we see that this function, ensure correct signature, has this, uh, well, you load the, the signature from the storage, of course, but if there is no value uh, stored, it calls unwrap or default. 
And what is the default for a binary? It's an empty string. So if you see it again, here you compare the signature against the signature it's stored in the storage, of course. Uh, and then remove it. So what is the attack? Instead of calling create NFT, we are going to call directly to register NFT with signature empty with another settings. What happens? It's going to verify that it ensures the correct signature, okay, because you are going to compare an uh, empty signature with what is supposed to be a default one. And after that, you can create more NFT contract. This example, guys, it's extracted from a real life protocol. It happened once. So, uh, Adelena is able to create <laughs> her NFT. Okay, remediation. Okay, first, I'm very clear, don't use default values. Or if you use it, uh, try to um, have mapped all your default values and, and verify that this kind of situation doesn't occur. But in general, it's, pref it's better to not use default values. <laughs> it's it's a, uh, to complicate the, the, co the logic of the code. Then we have incorrect recipient specification. Okay, as you know, in Cos and Watson, we have something very similar to ERC20, that it's called CW20. This CW20 have very interesting functions. One of them is transfer and the other is send. Sounds similar, but behaves differently. And now let's see. Okay, <laughs> what can go wrong? Uh, this is an example of a transfer. So we ha here we have the contract of our CW20 token. Luis has 500, Gabby has zero. Okay, now what happened when I transfer to Gabby 200? That the information that is stored in this smart contract is going to change. So Luis minus 200, now it's 300, and Gabby now has 200. So when Gabby uh, query about his balance, he's going to receive the amount of 200. Very clear, okay? That's transfer. But what happened with send? Send, most of the time, is for contracts. If we want to transfer tokens to, contact, to, to contracts, we use send. Again, this is the contract of the CW20 token, and this is the contract X that is going to be the recipient of the tokens. Now, I'm gonna send uh, to contract X the amount 200, and here there's another field called message. This message is supposed, uh, it's a base 64 encoded, and it's supposed to be, to be called in this contract. So now this receives this message and the contract, uh, well, updates the value and sends another message to contract X. Uh, the sender Luis, the amount 200, and the message is that. And here updates, for example, imagine this contract is a vesting contract, so it updates the, the credit for the user, in this case, 200. So the big question is, who sent the message to contract X? Was Luis or was the CW20 contract? Who do you think? Who says that Luis sent the, the message? No, nobody said Luis. Who said contra, uh, CW20 token? And the others, <laughs> who sent it? Okay, well, the thing is that the sender is supposed to be the uh, the contract, the CW20 contract. And this is important, it is key, because what can happen, let's see this. Okay, this is the same schema, and here appears our, our friend Anonymous, uh, and sends directly this message again. Uh, ah, by the way, attacker has zero tokens, he, hasn't, he doesn't have any token. So I'm gonna send a message, receive a sender attacker, uh, amount, this amount, 9,000, and message, this message, the same message. And what happens? Now that's the amount for the attacker is 9,000, without having any token here. Uh, now let's see an, a real life example. Um, uh, okay, now it's running a, a local version of a blockchain. Okay, just to have some context, this is a vesting contract. So you receive the money, and the money is supposed to be there for a period of time. 
okay? And after that period of time, you can withdraw the tokens. So, uh, let's continue with the video. Okay, it's finishing to, to run in the, the, um, the blockchain. Oh. I don't know if it's working. I'm going to show you here. Okay. So let's, okay, at some point, uh, we are going to co call this, this uh, file, JavaScript, and, okay. I'm going to pause here, just for you to show you. Here we have our token address of our CW20 token, and here we have our vesting contract. And we are created allocation for the owner. Oh. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's see. The owner has this amount of tokens, and this is the vesting period. Now, we are going to see this script. If you see this script, uh, we have an attacker that create this message. <coughs> the address is going to be the attacker. He's going to try to to create fake uh, tokens, and the thing is that all the parameters investing are zero. Why? Because at the end he wants to create fake tokens and try to withdraw as soon as possible. So let's continue with, a, with this video. We're going to see. Attacker has no allocation at this point. So when I run, he's going to run this, this uh, script that I showed you. And now, let's, let's stop here. Now you see that the attacker was able to create some allocation in the vesting contract. He has this huge amount of out of nothing. Now, because he established the parameter as zero, he can withdraw very, <coughs> very soon. So he tried to drain the vesting, and now he's the, um, the final balance for the attacker. Okay. And finally, uh, well, obviously, uh, the remediation is to ensure that the sender address is the token. So if the address is not a token, if it's, if it's, it's any other address, you are not supposed to process that uh, message. Finally, <coughs> lack of authorization. Uh, so here you see our function. This is for the Flappy Bird game. Here we have our function execute mint to user. So if you see, uh, appears a function called only admin. So only admin is supposed to call this mint to user. Uh, and it makes sense because if anyone can mine, mint uh, tokens to anyone, it's going to be uh, something crazy. If we go, if we see the, the code of only admin, we are going to see that it compares the admin that is stored in the contract against the sender. If it's different, it's going to throw an error message. Okay, so what can go wrong? So now, uh, let's change it. So, okay, okay. I'm going to show you. Here I have some scripts. Uh, and I have an script that it's mint, um, mint flap tokens. So I'm going to try to run this script, mint flap tokens. So what is going to happen if I, uh, in this mint flap tokens, I'm trying to create it, me as attacker, try to create tokens for me. Uh, well, if I run it, it's going to fail, of course. And here appears the error message. Uh, execute uh, unauthorized only. Only an administrator can call this function. Makes sense, right? But what happened here? If we continue seeing the code, we see that there is also a function called execute update config. And this function is not protected. So you can, <laughs> you can change the administrator from the contract. And let's do that. So we are going to run um, we're going to run uh, change admin. We're going to change the admin. Initial admin is this one. Okay, and final admin is my address. So now I'm the admin. We are going to run min flap tokens again. It's supposed to create 100 tokens for me. But before that, uh, we see that we have uh, only 21. 
So what happened? <laughs> Let's see. Okay, that is the initial balance. We are minting flap tokens. And in theory, now we have 121 tokens. Is it true? Let's see. We see the screen. Nothing appears to change. But if we load it again, now we have 121 tokens. Very, very easy. Okay. Uh, okay. Obviously, the recommendation is to try to reduce the access so only the admin can do any privilege function. You can use roles, for example, and you have to follow the principle of minimum privilege or the least privilege. So if a user is not supposed to do something, so reduce uh, their access. Okay, conclusions. Uh, well, as you can see, in a Web3 game, we can attack different components. We can attack client, we can, atta we can attack server, or we can attack even the smart contracts. So it's important to consider all of them. The thing is that if one of them, only one of them, it's compromised, it can compromise the whole, the whole game. It's important to, to take in consideration. And finally, security in Web3 gaming is a very new field, so uh, there is a, a lot of space for creating tools, uh, top 10, etc. And that's it. That's it. Thank you very much. Well, guys, open to any questions if there is any.